All right. Well, hello, everyone. I'm Howard Ratner, the Executive Director of Chorus, and welcome to Are We Ready for Data Citation Metrics? I welcome you all to today's forum as one of our series of Chorus forums. And as I've, I'm very happy to announce that we've had over 250 registrants today, and I know it's going to be an amazing one for, for all of us. So let's get right to it. I want to first thank our generous sponsors, the ACS, AIP Publishing, ACM, SPIE, and the AMS. Only through their help what is what makes our forums happen. So now I'm going to turn it over to the illustrious Shelley Stahl, who is the Senior Director for the American Geophysical Union's Data Leadership Program, to kick us off. So over to you, Shelley. Thanks, Howard. Um, thank you so much for Chorus for hosting today's web webinar. AGU has been working on challenges around sharing and citing data and software in collaboration with our community for well over a decade. Today's topic is a testament to the significant work establishing the value of data and software as important contributions to the scientific record that can be reused to further our understanding of the world and provide transparency to our methods. At AGU, our journal policies require that the data and software used in our published research be made available and cited so that it can be linked to the publication, providing transparency to the findings, as well as automated attribution and credit to the creators of those digital products, which makes sense. But in practice, it's really hard to do this. The scholarly ecosystem concerning data and software research products is actively working towards alignment but we're up against deep-seated reward structures that focus on peer-reviewed publications um, and less so on the data and software that support them. And funds are limited for curators to help researchers make their data as interoperable as possible. Researchers commonly use generalist repositories with little or no description of their data, making reuse very difficult. With these challenging gaps, the question remains, how do we look at a data set or software that's been shared to determine its contribution to the scholarly enterprise? And what would it look like as part of promotion and tenure processes? How do we evaluate well-established, well-prepared data sets that can be easily understood and interoperable as being a quality measure as compared to a quantity measure provided by a citation count? Today, we have two panels to help us understand where we are and consider possible next steps. Dr. Sarah Nusser, Professor Emerita of Statistics at Iowa State University and Research Professor of the Biocomplexity Institute at the University of Virginia, is leading our first panel, considering the lens of the researcher from the point of view of academia and government-funded research. And our second panel is led by Matt Buys, the Executive Director of DataCite, highlighting the current infrastructure efforts and the need for increased adoption of practices and policies that support both quality and quantity aspects of data and software preservation and sharing. So please, please use the Q&A function for your questions. Uh, and you can also upvote those questions to give priority to the, monitor, the, the moderators and the panelists. Um, and you're also welcome to use the chat to share your own observations. Sarah, are you ready to take it away? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Shelley, and welcome everybody. It's great to have you all here. Um, we're gonna begin by uh, hearing from four different perspectives in the data sharing ecosystem on current issues and potential fixes for ensuring citations and credit are given to researchers who prepare and share publicly accessible research data. Um, we're going to begin with Rick Gilmore, uh, who is providing the researcher uh, perspective um, on the ground. Rick uh, is a professor of psychology at Penn State University. He does research in the development of brain networks, and he's been an avid promoter of open science tools and practices, transparency and reproducibility, and he's co-founder of Databrary. Um, we will also look at uh, the issue from the university administration perspective, and we're lucky to have Dan Reed here, who is senior vice president for 
Academic Affairs at University of Utah and was formerly Vice President for Research and Economic Development at, at University of Iowa and my colleague when I was VPR there. Um, Dan hails from computer science and engineering, is currently working in the area of cloud and edge computing, and he's been very active in discussions uh, held within the uh, Association of American Universities and the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities to advance open science and data sharing across the academic system. Our third perspective is really from the point of view of uh, those who provide data services to researchers. Um, Amy Nurnberger is uh, the lead for the data management services at MIT Libraries. Uh, and through that role, she provides a full suite of research data services uh, to campus, but also she's been at the forefront of visioning for the 21st century of uh, the academic library, but also data sharing. And finally, we'll hear from a funder who's interested in understanding the ROI of shared data that has been funded by their grants. Uh, Me Megan Langseth is science data manager at the US Geological Survey. Um, she develops tools and workflows to ease the burden for researchers and data managers and has been working on ways to identify and evaluate the reuse of data that have been funded by the grants. Um, so I'm very excited to hear from all of these folks, and I would like to start by kicking it over to Rick to talk about the researcher perspective. Thank you, Sarah, uh, and thanks to the organizers for the invitation, and I want to thank uh, NIH and NSF for support. Next slide. To summarize my points, let me say that I think much more data can be shared much more widely than is now the case. Uh, I also think that in far too many cases, data sharing is viewed as having lower value than other products of scholarship. Uh, I know from personal experience that data sharing is much more work than it should be, especially if we want to make it much more widespread and more highly valued. Uh, if we want to expand data sharing, planning for it cannot begin too early. And if we want to expand data sharing, we need to give it real value and acclaim, celebrating exemplary practices and behaviors. Next slide. So in answering how do we value shared research data, I'd like to recast the question to ask instead, next slide, who values shared research data? And look at that in some detail. Next slide. Now, on the one hand, we all do value shared research data, or we should. If scientists had not openly shared the genome sequence of the COVID-19 virus in early 2020, it's safe to say that millions more would have died during the pandemic. Data sharing accelerates discovery and scientific advances made possible by sharing data can save lives. Next slide. But I think when we take a, look, a closer look at who values shared research data, the picture is more mixed. So funders value shared research data, but requirements to do so are relatively weak. Even the most recent NIH data sharing policy only requires a plan. Now, uh, many journals have implemented policies requiring data sharing, but just last week, I was reading a paper by a senior author in a highly cited journal supported by a funder with open access and data sharing requirements that said, and I quote, data sharing are available on reasonable request to the senior author. Institutions as the formal legal recipients of grant funding should value research data, but an another paper from the same research group explained their inability to share data because participants had only given permission for specific researchers at institution X or their collaborators to use. Now, researchers value shared research data in some fields because it would be impossible to do their work without it. But in others, especially those that I work within, shared research data is not as highly valued, um, at least relative to newly created data. Uh, that's especially true for experimental data where manipulations can be highly specific and are often not well documented. So what should we do? Next slide. I suggest that uh, to value research data, we give shared research data real value, as in money, resources, and yes, even fame. So funders should give more money or even top offs to researchers who actually share, who actually share and have a history of sharing. Um, I also advocate for what I call the 15% solution. So I'd like to see 5% of 15% of the research budget allocated to 5% uh, of it to archival uh, services involved in data curation, 5% to new secondary uses, and 5% to core operating support for open data repositories. 
Institutions should assume their full responsibility as grantees and provide data curation services for PIs. They should treat data as an asset shared with the community, not proprietary intellectual property, and also not as a liability. They should evaluate promotion and tenure policies that are biased against team, group, and collaborative efforts uh, relative to individual ones, as uh, the former are much more commonly associated with the production and use of shared data. Journals should consider reversing their funding model. What if papers that shared data were free um, and those that did not were required to pay a substantial publication fee? Uh, next slide. Society should provide guidance and support about where to share, how to share, and why, because researchers uh, need help in making uh, judgments about what places are most suitable for, for work in their fields. And someone, someone with lots of money, should come up with creative and high profile ways to make open data sharing cool, rad, dope, sick, and uh, truth in advertising. I had to ask my kids for what are the most appropriate popular slang terms for these. But the point is, um, we need to make uh, data sharing uh, to, uh, something that is exciting, where there's a lot of buzz around it. Um, and I've even suggested that uh, we have some sort of glam awards dinner with big cash prizes for people who've made significant contributions to open science and data sharing. And of course, researchers like me should stop finding reasons not to share and share their data. We create the scientific culture and only we can change it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Rick. Um, and next we will hear from Dan Reed. I just uh, want to correct something I wrote in the chat. If you have questions, please uh, put them in the Q&A box um, and we will have a little time at the end to have an open discussion, but we're happy to take thoughts and questions in the meantime. So Dan. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, and let's go on to the, the next slide. Um, you know, I, I want to echo some of the comments that were just made, and I thought about this great XC, XKCD cart a tune because it captures some of sometimes the dependencies that are hidden uh, where shared data and infrastructure supports a wide range of activities, but isn't necessarily acknowledged or, or recognized. I do want to point out um, some of the things that I think affect the culture as we think about rewards and recognition. And one of the ones that struck me a long time ago was the change in access of maybe the traditional experimental method where you constructed a hypothesis and you conduct and then conduct an experiment to gather data. Uh, and you had the unique infrastructure uh, meant that you could ask and answer specific questions that maybe other people couldn't without a lot of work. Shared data does change that dynamic. It shifts the power structure away from those who have unique data or unique infrastructure to those who can ask better questions. And one should not underestimate the power of sociology in affecting how we think about reward metrics, because it is challenging for some. It challenges their worldview about how they conduct scholarship uh, and indeed what the metrics and processes to evaluate those are. I think the other one that is really important, and I want to connect it back to uh, the remarks were made at the very outset about um, domain specific and cross domain recognition. I think one of the other sociological and cultural issues we need to face up to is that there's domain specific use and recognition, but there's also cross domain use and recognition. And one of our challenges may well be that when the value ceases to accrue to the discipline or the scholar or the institution, um, preserving that data and access to it may be critical for cross-disciplinary, transdisciplinary kinds of, of interactions. And that's a whole other uh, cultural and, and sociological set of issues. I think, let me speak specifically since I was asked to talk about promotion and tenure culture and dynamics. And, you know, there were very clear differences, as we all know, across units and cultures. I find myself uh, in these days in, a, in um, the role of reading every promotion and tenure case that our institution produces, and that's true of most provosts. Um, the issue that you realize very quickly is the culture of reward metrics varies widely across disciplines. Uh, and let me just cite a couple of examples. Think about um, a dancer in the performing arts. 
their artifacts in some sense are performances. And that's very different than a scientist uh, who's involved, say, in a whole sky survey research project, uh, working with thousands of people. It's true, uh, and I really think the shared data issue, as was noted at the outset, has a lot of analogs with the battles that we have had over recognizing software. And that's why I went with the, uh, the, the cartoon. Uh, and I will say in my discipline as a computer scientist, we fought this battle 30 years ago about recognizing conference proceedings versus journal publications. And to do that, we had to marshal the professional societies, uh, ACM and IEEE mostly, but also the research umbrella organizations to make the point that in our culture, there were different artifacts that mattered. And I think that will be one of the things that's required discipline by discipline as we think about those issues uh, with respect to preserving data. Uh, and so those metrics really, really matter. Uh, and as was noted, the questions about what are the appropriate metrics to recognize. I sometimes think with infrastructure, whether software or data, there are two failure modes. One is you put something out there after great work and nobody uses it. The other failure mode is everybody uses it and then you struggle with the sustainability questions. Uh, and there were some deep budgetary issues around culture there because we know that F&A costs now do not cover the true uh, underlying costs of research. And certainly those expectations from federal agencies about maintaining data post-grant period, as Sarah rightly noted at the outset, there's some deep issues around those challenges uh, as well. And so I think that we need to think hard about what an intellectual marketplace is for shared data and what the reward metrics are around that. It's more than simply access counts, uh, though those are an indicator of use, but how do we think about not only putting data out there for shared use, but recognizing that one of the key functions that librarians uh, uh, perform is data triage, deciding when something is no longer uh, should be kept. And there were similar issues around shared data. Uh, one can err on the not keeping enough, but you can't keep everything either. And so what community metrics do we develop for those? Those in the end, I think, will be the ones that surface uh, at an institutional and at a national recognition level to say this data uh, that was preserved is really, really important. And then the last thing I wanted to point out, which is probably obvious, but is the reward metrics and the culture about preserving data are quite different for single investigator or small groups than they are for large team science. Uh, in a large team science infrastructure, you know, people have designated roles. Um, people are building experimental apparatus or software and data infrastructure. That large team can itself generate some recognition for those individuals that'll propagate across their discipline. It's a different dynamic if you're an individual investigator. And that's why I said, I think we really have to think about how we engage societies, uh, professional societies uh, to think about uh, them promulgating what they believe are best practices. So those practicalities about uh, uh, metrics and how to triage, I think, are really important. Um, the diversity across disciplines and how to engage those different cultures and recognition. Uh, and then the economics uh, about, as was mentioned, uh, uh, Rick mentioned, how do we uh, recognize and reward investigators and institutions uh, and the units that preserve those data in appropriate ways. So those are a few thoughts. I look forward to the, the conversation, but I will say it varies widely across disciplines. That's really clear. How we think about that discipline by discipline is important. But I think uh, um, at academic institutions, professional societies, uh, and research organizations, we also have to think about that transdisciplinary set of issues because we know more and more of the critical questions we want to answer require fusion of data across disciplines. And that brings a whole other set of issues as Shelly noted about access, interoperability, metadata and support. And so let me leave it there and look forward to the uh, discussion and conversation. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, we will next turn to Amy Nurnberger.
Amy. Hi. Thank you very much. My name is Amy Nurnberger. My pronouns are she, hers. My thanks to the hosts and sponsors and everyone who made this forum a reality and everyone who's shown up because I really look forward to the discussion and the questions. Um, as you can tell from the, the work that I'm involved in, I am steeped in the concerns of data management and its associated work, its systems, its structures. My daily work is data its existence, its findability, its understandability, trustiness, usability. And for these reasons, this is why I think the better, the more appropriate question is whether or not data citation metrics are ready for us. Next. So regarding data citation, I can only paraphrase my fair lady and say, you know, we're willing to cite the data. We're wanting to cite the data. We're waiting to cite the data next. As information professionals, we have been raising the issue of standardized data citations for a while. Now, the earliest reference I could find in putting these slides together was Dodge 1982 on cataloging machine readable data files and interpretive manual. But I'm confident that there are earlier citations in this area, given the grand traditions that we have in scholarship and science around standing on the shoulders of giants, of not taking anyone's word for it, and trusting no one without their data. In the same NRC book that I've indicated here from 1985, on the very next page, it also speaks to the data sharing incentive system that we've already heard about from Shelley today and from uh, some of the other speakers as well, in its recommendation 16, that quote, institutions and organizations through which scientists are rewarded should recognize the contributions of appropriate data sharing practices, 1985. Now, of course, if data sharing and production can't be seen, it makes it difficult to recognize and reward it, to really plug into these incentive systems. So where are we right now? And what do we have in terms of, of systems? Next. So from a recent paper, the group at PLOS, we have data availability statements next. It's nice, but it's not sufficient for the purposes of credit or of metrics from the American Chemical Society's newly issued research data policy, there is the requirement to cite all publicly available data sets next. You can see where these two approaches get close to the issue, but don't quite get at it. Fortunately, what we need has already been laid out in Force 11's Joint Declaration of Data Citation Principles, next. Cite the data, next. Cite all of the data, broadly interpreted, regardless of its availability status. We cite materials with restricted access all the time. There's no need to start having a problem with that now. We cite not to make a statement about availability, because that's what data availability statements are for, but to point to where we came from. If you generate it, cite it. If you used it, to support your thesis, cite it. If you found an error, cite it. Because only when we are providing citations in a standardized way can we even begin to approach the question of metrics. Next. So the question of metrics. Our instincts are often when we hear data citation metrics to run down that same path that we already have with article metrics. But it's a fraught path, we know this already. Um, it has issues. We've seen that how we use article citation metrics does not in fact support the behaviors we want to see in science and scholarship. So addressing the misuses, misrepresentation of article citation metrics, how biases are incorporated into those systems and inequities occur geographically, culturally, among class as well. And being able to account for those in whatever systems we create for data citation metrics is absolutely important. I think next, we can do better. If we take the time to clearly lay out data citation metrics role and meaning for what it means for quality and impact, how do they work into incentives and rewards and recognition for researchers and institutions? And thinking about how inequities and biases can be weeded out rather than worked into these systems. 
one of the quotes next, one of the quotes that was associated with the, this forum was that in treating data as a first class research product, we need clear measures that describe the quality and impact of a shared data product. I agree that those need to be developed, but I would advocate that we actually start doing data citations before we hold ourselves back saying, what are the metrics associated with these? Let's start doing the data citation, get that horse out in front of the cart, let's let things work, and then we can start thinking about the metrics. And let's be honest with ourselves. The metrics are not something that is, you know, necessarily a neutral measure of good. Citations are politicized. And I think there's this great quote I just found um, earlier today um, that really indicates that there are many uses that metrics are put to, and it's not simply one of quality. There are many ways that they influence the system. Um, and they influence the system and how incentives and rewards are given. Next. Now, data citation and metrics are absolutely necessary for incentivizing a system of open scholarship. So we really need to be aware of what are the behaviors we expect to see, that we hope to see, that we want to see in continuing science and scholarship. As part of this, I would point you to the recent publication from NASM's Roundtable on Aligning Incentives for Open Science. It has some really great ideas in there. Next, we also, again, want to make sure that we're not replicating those interlocked, intertwined inequities and biases in our systems as we move forward into this new space of looking at data citation and creating systems of metrics around those data citation. Let's be really clear about how those metrics might be used in credit systems, how they represent different cultures, how they position different ethical perspectives and how they're supported by what resources and infrastructures and what are the systems and biases that need to be considered in those places. Next. So before we get to data citation metrics, we strongly think we need to normalize that practice of data citation and along in that pathway, develop those shared understandings around their meaning and their use. And in doing that, we can then build the infrastructures that are going to support the desired outcomes. Next. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Amy, for that thought provoking outline. Um, I would like to, uh, last but not least, turn to Megan, um, who's going to speak from the funder's perspective. Hi, thank you. So today um, I'll be presenting on behalf of myself and my colleagues, Vid Hutchinson and Grace Donovan, about how we are attempting to understand the impact of our published data at the U.S. Geological Survey. The US, uh, next slide, please. The U.S. Geological Survey is a bureau within the Department of the Interior focused on earth sciences, including water, biology, energy and minerals, and hazards. We provide unbiased, reliable scientific research to other scientists, to decision makers, to policymakers, and to the public. Next slide, please. Within the USGS, I'm with the Science Data Management team. Our mission is to optimize and share USGS data management best practices and workflows to ensure that USGS scientific data are fully described, preserved, and publicly accessible. We do this by maintaining a suite of enterprise tools, coordinating communities of practice, promoting best practices through webinars and our data management website, and participating in policy development. Next slide. In 2016, USGS released its public access plan and a series of data-related policies, which include a requirement for our researchers to provide timely public access at no cost to their, the, the scientific data that are developed or funded by the USGS and support our scholarly conclusions. To release their data, researchers are required to create formal complete metadata and have their data and metadata reviewed and approved. Next slide. So researchers are putting in a lot of effort to get their data released, and our science data management team wants to help these researchers, as well as USGS leadership, understand the impact of releasing these data. And we're trying to do this through a couple of different mechanisms. First, we're trying to understand how data are accessed at the repository level through number of views and downloads. And second, we're trying to understand data use through data citation tracking. Next slide. 
So the Science-Based Data Release Summary Dashboard is a tool that we've developed to help USGS center directors and data managers understand how many data releases their center is producing over time and the impact of those data releases through landing page views and file downloads. Next slide. To understand data use, we wanted to implement a comprehensive approach to tracking data citations to help our researchers and USGS leadership understand where data are being reused in the published literature. Due to limited resources and the number of USGS data being released, we needed an automated approach to tracking citations. When we first started this citation tracking endeavor, we figured that publishers would know this information, at least when authors include data citation in their work cited. But we found that publishers were not always sharing that information in an easily accessible format. And authors were not always providing formal citations to data in their publications, even though they might have been mentioning the data in the publication text. At that time, some of our colleagues had been using XDD, formerly known as GeoDeepDive, to mine full text articles for information. XDD negotiates agreements with publishers to allow programmatic mining of published content. Currently, there are over 14 million documents in XDD. And we focused on using this service to look for references to data site DOIs within, uh, uh, th that had our USGS 10.5066 prefix. So XDD will return articles that include 10.5066 DOIs, as well as a snippet of the information around that mention to provide a little context of where it's being used. We built a Python package called PubLink to help us build relations between data and the publications in which they are referenced. We use PubLink to mine XDD weekly for new references. We store the publication DOI that is referencing the data site DOI as a related identifier in the data site DOI's metadata. We then display the related citations in the USGS Science Data Catalog, which is our metadata catalog. Next slide. We wanted to try to get a sense for how many references to data we are capturing through our XDD tracking pipeline, which is, is pretty challenging to do actually. Um, but we do have some data that allowed us to get an approximate approximation of the percentage that we might be capturing. So when a USGS researcher requests a DOI for their data, we ask if there will be an associated publication using those data, and if yes, uh, we ask them to provide the publication's DOI. So we are using these researchers, these USGS researchers, and their associated publications as a, a proxy to assess how researchers in general might be citing or referencing data in publications. We found that a little over 70% of these publications are indexed in XDD. So right away, we know that XDD does not index all of the publishers relevant in our domain. We took this subset of publications in XCD and looked at what information was available in the publications cross-ref DOIs, as well as what, whether or not the associated data DOI was mentioned in the full text of the article. On the left, we can see that about half of the publications had detailed references listed in their cross-ref DOIs. Of those, a very small percentage of articles per year had the data DOI listed in the references available in, in Crossref. In contrast, on the right, we looked to see if the data DOIs were at least mentioned in the full text of these publications. We found that around 60 to 70% of publications per year mentioned the data DOI in the full text. However, there is still a substantial percent of of publications that are, are not mentioning or referencing the data that were used. That means that there is work to be done uh, to educate researchers about referencing data, as well as to collaborate with publishers to ensure that these references are passed to Crossref in a structured format. So while we know that our XDD track, uh, citation tracking is likely missing data citations due to the fact that a number of publishers relevant in our domain do not have their articles indexed in XDD, but it, it captures more information than we would have otherwise. Next slide, please. So what are our next steps at USGS? Well, first, we need to revisit the, the counter code of practice for research data to ensure that the counts that we are providing 
for our, our data access counts are standardized and comparable with the rest of the scientific community. Next, even though we did not find a large percentage of data citations in cross-ref references for our subset, many publishers are now accepting and encouraging data citations in the references section of articles. And we hope that over time, the number of data citations found in cross-ref structured references will increase. So we don't currently have a mechanism to bring these formal citations into our reporting pipeline. So we want to explore the, the Scholix API to help us capture data use for publications not indexed in XDD. Finally, we will continue to educate our researchers and our in-house publishing staff about the importance of data citation and how to cite data that they use in their publications. Next slide. So thank, thank you for having me. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. And I've listed our contact information of, on the slide. So please do feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thank you, Madison and uh, Amy, Dan, and Rick uh, for some really informative discussions. And I, I wonder, uh, there's been quite a bit of discussion in the chat about societies and different disciplines. and. Um, I, I have sort of a two-pronged question to ask of each of the uh, individuals. One is, um, are there specific, you know, riffing on Dan's models around software, adopting software as a uh, item for credit in PNT? Are there disciplines, models that we can borrow from, and other disciplines? And what do you, what do you think you or the faculty that you interact with can do to incite their disciplines? And I, I want to give a shout out to uh, Brooke, because I'd like to call on you to give a disciplinary response uh, to these comments. So um, let's see, who would like to go first? Dan, do you want to chat about this? I'll certainly chat. I'm not sure I have any deep insights. I think you know, step one is making the, is having leaders in the discipline uh, agitate for awareness. You know, if I think back again about the history of computer science, it really took the leading lights in the discipline to get together and say, this is a problem. And we're gonna use our reputations as a bully pulpit to put out some white papers that make a statement about what we see is important. I think that's one way to drive change in the discipline. Some of the comments in the chat about, you know, how does this impact recommendation letters? Well, I mean, those are the people who are gonna be writing letters. You're asking some leading lights in the field to assess the quality and impact of the scholars. If they're on board, it will filter down, but you kind of have to stop start, I think, at, at the intellectual top, because if you think about the broad base of universities, uh, down at, at the lower ranked levels, they are followers of what happens uh, in the disciplinary societies and the more highly ranked units. So you need to engage at that level, but we also need more movement, I think, on the, the part of the agencies. Uh, Sarah, I'll give a shout out to her, has done yeoman service trying to get agencies to, to think about what are standards across agencies and trying to promulgate those uh, in some ways that uh, uh, try to deal with the fact that you don't want better to be the enemy of good. You want to start someplace and make something happen, and then you can build on it because once the tide starts to shift, it's easier to move uh, the rest of things, but you got to start someplace, and that's, that's my two cents on how you start. Yeah, that's that's great, Dan. Um, I, do do uh, any of the other speakers want to comment? I see that Brooke is willing to Brooks is willing to give a perspective here. Brooks, um, are you able to turn on your camera and unmute? Um, yep. Uh, hopefully, you can hear me. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so I uh, agree completely with Dan. Uh, I, I'm really excited. Uh, great presentations and thanks everybody for organizing um, this. I think it illustrates how really to solve this. Um, one, all the stakeholders have a key role to play in this, both at a leadership role and a kind of driving cultural change role. At a, so, so sort of at a grassroots level too. Um, 
also, um, uh, also, I think in many ways, the solutions are at hand. We just need to really have the will to implement them. We, we kind of know what we have to do, but getting to actually doing it is hard. Um, I've also, from the funder's perspective, I've, I've advocated that one big thing funders could do is keep the um, uh, kind of intellectual merit part of grants, but really elevate the open science and open data part into that in some way. So the, the data management plans are great, but they're still kind of an afterthought. Um, I think certainly at the university level, kind of encouraging uh, both the top, top down and grassroots. So if you're gonna write a letter, um, please, um, a recommendation letter, please talk about open science and open data. At the society level, um, we've worked through at AGU following actually a couple other societies, we weren't the first, including open science in our fellowship um, application so that we expect fellows, in addition to doing great research to do it um, openly and to share their data. Um, and that's that's an expectation along with um, DEI development and community engagement and things like that. So I think we're at the point where we kind of know what to do and appreciate the, the mention of the Force 11. The Force 11 data citation guidelines have been signed by almost all the publishers five years ago. So again, we kind of know, we know what to do. It's a matter of, and we know how to do it. Um, 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 a great a great presentation on kind of the Crossref data site infrastructure and that is getting fixed. There was a couple bugs in there that, you know, publishers weren't all doing the right thing. So I think everything's ready. We, we and I'm really hopeful um, that all the parts can start working together and um, that conversations like this where we get all the stakeholders together are really important as well to, to, to make sure that we're aligned. So thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, Brooks. Um, I, I applaud AGO's efforts to bring societies forward through their seminar series and many other actions. Um, the, the other topic that's really getting a lot of uh, discussion in the chat has to do, uh, I, I, in my mind, it sort of centers on the whole business of credit and what other metrics are there. And I, uh, Amy has put forth the idea that uh, let's get citations going and then we'll worry about other things like impact and, and so on. Uh, I wonder if the uh, speakers would like to make a comment on, on that. Would, if, if we just focused on citations, would that help in the p and process? That would surely help funders like USGS. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? And let me, uh, let me ask uh, if nobody wants to volunteer. Oh, I see, Dan, you're up. Um, no, okay, go ahead. Well, I mean, I do think it will help, but you know, in the end, if you think about, um, and someone mentioned this, I think in the chat, uh, it's really about um, recognition of quality and impact. And I, I um, let's put it this way. We, uh, let's pick on publications. We all know people who've written a gazillion publications that if we're really honest, they had limited impact on the field. We also know some people who had a much more modest number of publications who transformed fields. So it's necessary, but not sufficient. I think the key thing is the culture issue. You know, the recognition that this is a peer scholarly intellectual contribution. If you get over that hurdle, everything else kind of happens for free. And I don't mean to minimize it, it's hard, but it is that culture issue that drives everything else. And you know, I'm a big believer that, that culture eats process for breakfast. So you gotta get the culture right and then the, the, the process will follow. Rick, would you like to share anything from a researcher's perspective? I, I, I actually very much agree with what Dan said because um, I don't know how we get citations never seems to be enough, but what are your thoughts? So we've often said this, I've said this to my colleagues that, that citing resources, right, is the sort of scholarly minimum. It's, it's expected behavior. And, um, and so adding citations to various kinds of resources, software, data, data sets, et cetera, um, even materials, I think is, is, is a, a minimal expectation that we can all have. It does have the additional facet of creating some incentive for researchers to uh, store and share the data. Uh, but I think that in, in the fields that I'm most closely associated with, uh, there still is a significant barrier uh, 
to getting data to be cited. Uh, and the, the main reason for that is many data sets are, are idiosyncratic and insufficiently well documented uh, that another person would find it a real struggle to reuse them or combine them um, across data sets. And so, so, you know, I think in some fields we're, uh, you know, what's, what's uh, even behind uh, the cart, right? So the, the space behind the cart, we need to figure out how do we improve data documentation um, and make curation less onerous so that the data that are shared can be, can be reused. And uh, one very tiny aspect of this that uh, Karen Adolph, my uh, collaborator and co-director on Databrain have been advancing, uh, and I think this applies across experimental sciences, is the use of video recordings of experimental procedures. It's, a, it's essentially uh, and very easy to do in the behavioral sciences, but I think there are many er other areas of, of experimental work where video recorded procedures, you know, what, what do people do with what materials, when and why, um, can go a long way toward capturing uh, some procedures that might otherwise be elusive. But that's, that's only a very small, small part of a much bigger problem. Yeah, so we're, we're piling up the, the card. I, I also agree with Rick, we need to think harder about what data means. I see you put a comment in the Q&A around that. Um, Amy, uh, I see you, your video is up. Would you like to make some comments about a very practical first step to our problem here? I'll let Michael go ahead first and respond. After oh, okay. That. Yeah, Thank good. you, uh, Michael. I just you had made a few comments on this topic, so I wondered if you wanted to share anything, if you're able to and willing to unmute and uh, share your vid video. Thanks, uh, thanks, Sarah. Um, uh, so I'm I, I speaking from the software side of this. I had a. Um, the CompsysNet, which is a software repository, and we're interested in the same issues for software, for scientific software as for data. I agree absolutely with Amy that uh, we we have the the mechanisms are in place. We just need we need to cite things, um, and and that's that's absolutely important. Um, but I think Dan's point is is equally important that we need to make these links between the the appropriate and ethical practice of citing data and software and the, the rewards part of it. And once we get those, once we get that feedback link set up, then a lot of the other issues, including the, the things that Rick's talking about, they're not solved, but they sort of fall into place. There's, there's mechanisms already there to, to start to deal with some of these issues of quality, the difference between data that's heavily used and data that's not very impactful and not used and poor quality data and better quality data. So um, um, right now we, we don't, and as Shelley well knows, the, the link between the, this ethical practice and then getting some kind of a, not, not like necessarily a, 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 an index, but simply a count just so that we know what, that, our, that our work has been cited or not. And this is, this is not the best proxy of quality, but you've got to, someone said, you've got to start somewhere. And, and this, is, this is the system that's already in place for other kinds of scientific products. And we, did, we somehow just need to, to hook into this and and uh, it will it will be better it won't be solved but it'll be better yeah absolutely and i want i want to do a friendly amendment that uh, i think part of what rick is talking about is what else gets shared with the data so it can be reused which i i yeah. think is another really important part of this, yes. this system um we're almost at time amy would you like to or megan do you have any comments you would like to share um, just, just really quickly, uh, thank you for the acknowledgement. Yes, we need to get data citations out there. That is the first step, but but I was careful to say that's not the only step either. Um, it, 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 it is the necessary food for that incentive system. So yet, yes, we can create that cycle, but we but we need the we need that push to get that inertia in motion instead of just sitting there because right now we're just kind of sitting here and we need to we need to push it forward and part of that i think is requirements for data citations expectations for data citations and that comment that yes we need to change the culture and the people who can change the culture are the leaders of the culture the ones that hold the leather levers whether that's in societies or funders or the leaders the, the sparkling lights of the field and along with that in changing that culture recognizing that 
citations don't equal quality. Citations equal a lot of other things, but not necessarily quality. And you won't get your data cited and reused if your data, if the accompanying documentation around your data doesn't allow reuse. So that's just a subtle push in that space that you better get your metadata, you better get your instructions up to scratch. Otherwise, it's not going to get reused. It won't get cited. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Madison. Um... Yeah, I, I just wanted to add, add another thought here. So um, at the USGS, and I know a lot of other agencies as well, um, part of re our, our research and why we do it is to provide that, that scientific um, information and data to policymakers and decision makers. And so part of assessing the impact is, you know, do these data influence, you know, policy? Um, and, and so that's another aspect. And I'm not sure yet, how, how do you even track that? So in addition to um, its impact in the academic uh, field, how is it impacting you know, our daily lives through, through what happens with policy and things like that? And how do we track where those data get used in those decisions? Is that, that's just another aspect um, for us to think about when we think about impact. Yeah, and uh, Madison, that bridges to a lot of work that's going on at the government level about evidence-based policy making um, and data sharing at the um, government uh, across government agencies and with with researchers, um, uh, just to promote more use of data for policy. Um, okay, I'm I two corrections. One is I am very sorry, Madison, to call you Megan, um, and uh, second. Um, I, we actually have until noon, and so I'm wondering if uh, I, I saw Stephanie had made some comments around style manuals and some of the issues around um, library and research data services. I wondered if you were willing to speak a little bit, uh, Stephanie, on that topic, or uh, maybe Amy wants to discuss that area. Sure. Um, so from, from my perspective, I'm going to talk about it in the second uh, section too, but um, I think we've heard a lot of like, what should we be doing first? And for me, as a perspective of someone who, you know, uses metrics or designs metrics as a bibliometrician, um, I think we actually need to work on both ends of like, you know, making the practice more common that people cite data sets formally and at the same, in the same vein, improve the metadata that we do collect. Um, to increase the citations on the other angle. And both of those things are needed to create meaningful metrics because we can't really uh, come up with anything that's, you know, like better than just uh, um, an absolute count that without context doesn't tell us much if we don't have metadata, like for example, the discipline. And we've heard so much that we already know that I really liked uh, the example before I think Daniel brought it up of like a theater performance, uh, which which is probably an uploaded video. That's the data, um, and then somebody working, uh, you know, in in a STEM field where uh, a huge group of researchers collects something with um, instruments. Um, so we know disciplines. Uh, consider things, they consider data completely different, they use data different, they produce it differently. So they're also gonna, we already know this, gonna produce different amounts of data. So if we're talking about metrics and we're starting to count things, we have to take this into account. But right now we're at a level where we don't have enough metadata about like, what is this discipline of the data set? So we can create any meaningful metrics. And I think the, the biggest thing we want to avoid is making the same mistakes as the bibliometrics community has done. We don't want another data impact factor where we, you know, we can't compare different disciplines. We don't want a data age index because that, you know, the whole indicator is just flawed and they're so too simplistic. So we need to field normalize and things like that. Um, but we don't have that information at the moment. So unfortunately, I think we can't just you know, we have to push things forward. Well, we need to do it on the, the practice end and the metadata quality um, uh, to, to push it forward and then get, go to the metrics. Yes, okay, thank you very much. Um, any other comments from our panelists? We have a, another open question that came in. Um, so Laura asks about a, uh, you know, she, she notes that the, um, it should be less expensive to reuse data than to run a survey uh, or do another experiment. And, and that actually 
uh, and the research that uh, my team at UVA has done about researcher perspectives, this is really a very strong motivator for reuse of data. Um, and she asked a question really about searching and, uh, and finding data um, and uh, the business of being able to you know, trust data and so on. I don't know, Rick, if you have some thoughts on that or uh, maybe Madison does from that, uh, from the perspective of having to find um, uh, data. Yeah, I'll just say briefly. I think think uh, the Laura has has hit uh, hit the you know the nail on the head there. That this it is uh, in in theory easy to use uh, data that have already been collected. Data that are well curated and well organized uh, can be quite easy to use. Um, I would add to that uh, data that are in a repository that can be accessed via maybe a web based DOI uh, also uh, is a, a virtue. But that's a uh, much rarer, uh, at least in the behavioral sciences, uh, well, I would say psychology and neuroscience, uh, than it might be in other fields. So uh, the barriers there are really come down to how well the data have been documented and organized and curated. Uh, and so I, I, I think there are some understandable trade-offs that researchers make and say, in fact, for my particular set of questions, it is less expensive and more efficient for me to collect new data. So uh you know like water running downhill i think you know we all uh in the research world are trying to, to do the best we can do to follow the the, the forces that shape us yeah and I, i'll just add that um in the research we've done that a lot of people find data by reading other people's papers or talking to them at, at conferences and so there's this whole informal network that we don't really think about when we talk about the data ecosystem that uh maybe are there's some levers to be pushed there Okay, um, there is a lot going on in the chat. Um, yeah, Madison. Yeah, so so I'll say from the USGS perspective, when it comes to sharing data, I think we fall into two different um, fields, right? So there are some uh, organizations underneath the, the USGS that are kind of data shops where their main goal is to produce these large, well-documented, easy to use data sets. And then there are other researchers who are doing their, in their individual projects and their main output is, is going to be their, their publications, their papers, the knowledge that they're, they're putting out into the world. And as a byproduct, they're required to release their data. And so they do that because they have to, um, but not always in the best way. So it, it's usually well-documented because they have to write metadata but they might be just sharing a portion of their data. Um, and then they're gonna share another portion of those data in their next publication. Um, and so if we can get to the point where, where they're compiling their data and integrating it and, 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 and putting it out there together, then that data will become easier to reuse. If it's just a snippet of the data, it might not be as valuable as if here's this entire corpus of, of uh, you know, data on you know subject x um and, and then then somebody can take it and actually run with it as opposed to oh those are just a small subset of what you used in that one particular paper yeah excellent point um i think there's there's a lot going on in academia that that ends up parsing data products um okay we are at time um and i just want to thank our panelists and uh our audience and all the people who put things into the chat um, terrific discussion. I'm going to send it back to Howard or Shelley, whoever's going to take us forward. So that will be me. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, thanks. That was that was awesome. Um, the chat was incredible. Um, and so we're now going to go on break. But before you go off on break, uh, Tara is going to post a uh, a Mentimeter uh, slide for you to start to fill out because um, we would like to get some of your feedback um, and the particular question is what do you think is needed for data citation metrics so go ahead and start filling that out and i'll populate on the screen um, it'll be up there um, during the 10 minutes so and we welcome you all to come back at 12 10 so see you soon
All right. It looks like the Menti has capped out at about 50 people contributing. Thank you all very much for that. We will be publishing the Menti results along with our summary of the event um, after afterwards. And we'll get to that as soon as we can. So I'm going to move us along here. Whoops. So our second session um, will be led by um, by Matt, and uh, Matt comes is the is the exec director of Data Site, and uh, over to you, Matt, for whenever you'd like to get started. Great, thanks very much, um, Howard, and thanks to um, everyone that organized the event, and thanks to everyone for attending. Um, these are great opportunities for us to come together, discuss um, these collective efforts and the way forward. So um, really important for us. If you can jump to the next slide, um, Howard. Um, as Howard mentioned, I am the executive director at Datasite and at Datasite we very involved and um, do a lot of work around make data count and our efforts um, within the various initiatives. And we know that today we are all sitting here um, thinking about the development of these responsible evidence-based open data metrics. And so coming together as a community around data metrics is around building, contextualizing, advocating for this work, but also doing this in a transparent, open and responsible manner. And so the panel in this session um, brings together these experts that will share some insight into the different infrastructure efforts um into the community advocacy and into the adoption um of, of um data metrics and thinking about next steps as a collective initiative we know obviously looking at um the research life cycle that research articles provide a fraction or they provide um some of the information required to fully evaluate a scientific study and so they provide the succinct description of the methods and the work carried out, as well as the conclusions drawn based on that work. But most of the time, there's not this underlying information available, no mechanism to easily link um, to experimental design, to the research data, to the analytical tools. And so this is really important to us as data site, as a global community, but also um, to everyone here on the call today. And so the challenge really prevents us from being able to fully understand the results of research. And I am, I guess, preaching somewhat to the choir today in that this is what we all believe in, but really just providing this context um, to start. Are we ready for data citation? I think we all um, can agree that no, we are not. And why we are not ready? Well, through the panel, we're going to talk through some of the different issues and things that we're working through, but also where we are in this collective effort um, as a community and the steps that need to be taken to, to move forwards. And so with that, I will hand over to our first speaker. Um, just to mention that um, the speakers will each have um, five minutes, so we'll, we'll go through the five uh, presentations and then we will have a uh, opportunity to um, reflect on some of the presentations um, please add any q a into the um, uh, box at the bottom um, or any chats and, and we'll pick that up um, at the end of the five presentations so with that i'll hand uh, back over to howard who's also presenting in this session um, howard doesn't need an, another introduction but um, howard is the executive director of chorus and he'll be starting the panel with um, a presentation about the AGU and Coleridge story and the work that they've been doing at Chorus. So over to you, Howard. Thanks, Matt, and hello, everyone, again. Um, so let me tell you just a small bit about Chorus and what we're doing regarding data. So Chorus is dedicated to making open research work. And we've been doing so since 2013. Our goals are to help make sure the main stakeholders are publishers, institutions, and funders are all scaling their OA compliance. We're working to develop metrics about open data, and we help our stakeholders improve the quality of their metadata related to open research. And most recently, as Matt inferred, we have been hosting forums and workshops to raise awareness for all and also doing pilots. <clears throat> Chorus monitors for open access on publisher sites. 
We connect data sets to publish content. We link articles to agency portals and grants where available. We publish dashboards, reports, and APIs for our funder, institution, and publisher stakeholders. We connect these stakeholders to each other so they can learn from each other and hopefully build some trust. We help conduct and participate in open science pilots. We host webinars and meetings on all of the topics that are listed here. And all of this helps our stakeholders improve their metadata by giving rapid feedback about the quality of metadata that is being seen. For example, using our dashboards and reports, publishers, institutions, and funders can enhance their open science compliance tracking and improve their metadata. Chorus has taken part in a number of open science initiatives. Most recently, in 2020, Chorus was named in a two-year NSF grant awarded to the American Geophysical Union to implement fair data practices across the earth, space, and environmental sciences. Specifically, the scope of the work is about data citations in AGU content for research funded by NSF grants. These are going to be captured in an upcoming version of the NSF Public Access Repository, which some people call PAR 2.0. So Chorus helps by presenting customized data set reports over the two year project, including linked articles, name and type of data set, repository and creator names, subject classifications, and reuse license information. We help AGU and others improve their data citation deposits into the NSF PAR, and we also help to develop and further open data citation best practices. But even more recently, Chorus became a partner in the Coleridge Rich Context Project. Now, this aims to apply machine learning and natural language processing techniques that search publications provided by Chorus members to find what data sets are in the publications, to show how they've been used, to find other experts who have been used the data, to identify other related data sets, and importantly, to show the impact of funded data sets back to the US agencies, institutions, and publishers in an ongoing service. So how was this done? Well, it was done using a Kaggle contest, which was held earlier this year. And there was over 1,000 expert teams competing to develop the best algorithms and workflows for these problems. A summit was just held last week, and numerous pilots have already started to take this work forward. So Chorus is dedicating to finding the gaps between our stakeholders in open research workflows by examining issues and problems, and then trying to fill those gaps by working towards solutions, pursuing common ground and identifying opportunities. Why don't you come join our community so we can help us help you? Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Howard. Um, appreciate you also working within the time frame. I know five minutes is, is tricky for the um, panelists. Um, next up, we have um, Lucia Maloney, um, who um, is working on a related project with data sites of fair implementation workflows. Uh, Lucia um, is a professor at Max Planck um, who leads a large project, the Cogitate project, and will be um, providing a bit of a researcher pers perspective around why data citation and credit matters within the Cogitate project, so um, within her group, um, and a bit uh, share a few thoughts with us um, from that perspective. So over to you, Lucia. Thank you, Matt, and thanks everyone for this very nice and inspiring discussion. And I apologize for my voice, I'm a little bit sick, but at least I have a voice. Uh, a couple of days ago, she didn't have that. Uh, <clears throat> and what I want to do today is to walk you a little bit through um, a very innovative project that I'm leading um, that is uh, funded by the Templeton World Charity Foundation. And the challenges that we have, uh, we have actually faced through this project, in which we're trying to do an exemplary role model for open science from idea generation to hopefully all the way up to uh, data, uh, publishing the data and publishing the paper. So this is a study, uh, this is a project that is funded, as I said, by the Templeton World Charity Foundation. And I wanna thank uh, Andrew Saracen, the president and David Podgitter. <coughs> so today we have an opportunity to accelerate research and consciousness and to achieve these, we pursue a deeply transformative approach. This entails experimentally eliminating theories by making use of adversarial collaboration thereby hopefully increasing confidence in the surviving theories. We are creating large reproducible, transparent and open data that hopefully will drive uh, trustworthy science. And we are encouraging global participation and tapping the expertise of the scientific community and industry at large. And next slide, please. 
Um, so what is our approach? Our, our approach starts by comparing the two most prominent theories of consciousness. In this case, it's global neural workspace theory and integrated information theory. Uh, these two theories could not be more different in terms of how they explain consciousness. For instance, GNW posted that key structures for consciousness involve the frontal part of the brain the, or, the, or the front, uh, whereas in turn, uh, IAT proposes that areas in the posterior part of the brain uh, are very important for consciousness. And to accelerate research on consciousness, we compared these two theories in, a, in an adversary collaboration. We have teamed up with the two proponents, in this case, Stanislas Dehan and Julio Tononi, to put forward testable but opposing predictions, such that hopefully at the end of this enterprise, one of the theories gains strong support and the other one doesn't. And we have pre-registered everything from the very beginning. So the idea is to start into from this project from the beginning to be open for everyone. Next, please. And um, so what is the second aspect of this project, which is, makes it very remarkable? We are using a multi-scale, multi-model approach to study the brain combining invasive and non-invasive methodologies available to human neuroscience from uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging to magnetoencephalography to invasive electrocorticography. And this, we hope that this multi-model approach will realize one of the most encompassing investigations in your substrate of consciousness to date. Third, we are obtaining data on over uh, 500 individuals, <clears throat> constituting again one of the late, late largest exploration, uh, in, in particular with multimodal integration and hopefully also high statistical power. Fourth, we are using identical standardized study protocols and processing pipelines across all experiments and all steps, fostering reproducibility. Five, we have inbuilt replications. We use half of the data to test our hypothesis, the other half to verify our conclusions. And we hope that with that, we uh, ensure trustworthiness result. And last but not least, we have an impartial team of labs around the world that will conduct the experiment and analyze the data, assuring the high standard, the high scientific standards and uh, preventing biases as, far as, as, as much as we can from tainting the result. Next slide. So where are we now? Um, we have lined up a, a, a world-class team of investigators. This entails 11 institutions around the world that collect the data. As, he, as I mentioned before, they collect data in duplicate. So there is two teams that collect electrocorticographic data in two different locations in the world, a function like the resonance imaging data, all, uh, also in two um, uh, 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 places in the world, the same for uh, EMG. Next. So this, is all, this all sounds great. And it has been great, except for the part, except for the fact that it has been extremely challenging. And part of the problems that we have found out is that when we try to document the whole research cycle, we first of all understand that there is many more research outputs that we produce, especially when we want to produce very, um, very reliable results. So, for example, we have spent an, an, an enormous amount of time trying to standardize instruments across different laboratories. We have spent even more time trying to develop standardized protocols such that two research teams, when we acquire the data, they actually collect the very same, uh, they have the very same quality data and so on and so forth. So now when you try to actually put all of these into the credit author statement, it's just not enough. And, and furthermore, what actually happens also is that different, re different um, researchers contribute differently to, for instance, software generation or data curation or resource generation or supervision or conceptualization. As you can see here, we, you know, we have these two proponents that actually were, play a critical role in the generation of the ideas, but we don't want them to actually collect the data, right? Um, and this actually creates a really, you know, and we have been, this has been raised before, but creates a large problem and not a small problem for our researchers. And in particular, because now what's gonna happen in, in the best outcome, we're gonna have a lot, hopefully a very nice paper with a number of authors and who is gonna know who did what. So other um, international consortiums, uh, next please, such as International Brain Lab have tried to solve this riddle by creating a rooster of different roles where they try to put for every researcher what they have contributed to, which actually makes it better, except for the fact that, can you go for the next one, Matt? Um, that a, a lot of this information does not necessarily trickle down the different research outputs that we have and doesn't necessarily even go into the data citation counts that we have. So as researchers, from our point of view, what we are looking for is on the one hand, for publishers to recognize the fact or, 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 or for us as researchers to recognize the fact that we have many more outputs in our research from pre-registration to data, software, et cetera. 
Second, what we are trying to do is hopefully to deposit those data in simple repositories that from our point of view, so long they, they uh, um, serve, uh, our, they meet the, the core functional requirements, we are okay with that. Um, yet, as researchers, what we want to do is to be able to track credit for research contributions within a project, and this includes identifications of contributed roles. So the data side meta schema can be used to track contributor, contributor roles, and then a research data can be cited. Yet, for this to be realized, publisher must ensure that they capture the data citation in the article metadata so that credit can be provided to the individual. So this will help us move forward collect, uh, collective efforts to make that account. And I hope that with that, if you go to the last one, we can, uh, can you go one more? More, one more, one more. And I hope that with that, we can credit this whole set of researchers who are very courageously trying to change the sociology of science by making it open, reproducible, and transparent, and yet don't necessarily have the capacity to be properly credited. So thank you. Great, thanks very much, Lucia. And um, it's great to have the perspective of the complexity of these large scale projects and, and different um, elements to, to consider. So then moving, moving along in the panel, we um, will next hear from Stephanie Holstein, who's an associate professor at University of Ottawa, and Stephanie spoke a bit earlier. Stephanie will start to surface the bibliometrics perspective in some of the work that is underway. Over to you, Stephanie. Yeah, thank you, Matt, for the introduction and thank you for the uh, invitation to be here. Um, so yeah, so the question is, are we ready for data citation metrics? Next slide, please. Uh, and my answer is no. <laughs> and that doesn't mean I don't think we should work towards them. Uh, I very much do think so, because I think they can help as an incentive to, you know, make data be counted as a first class um, scholarly output, like uh, articles, for example. But I think we're right now not there yet, because we don't have um, enough information. Next slide, please. So, um, so I'm somebody coming from with a bibliometrics background. So we use and design metrics, and just uh, you know, very uh, simply put together here, some bullet points about what makes a good metric and what makes a bad bad metric. And obviously, we all want to avoid. Uh, creating bad cita data citation metrics because they create adverse effects. And we have seen this uh, a lot before um, in bibliometrics. So if we're looking at the more traditional um, citation metrics that focus on uh, articles or journals, we know, for example, that um, they are very simplistic and reductionist. Um, they uh, are often flawed in design. So for example, if we take the H index, like the, uh, the whole formula doesn't make any sense as an indicator, uh, but also we know the, the history of the impact factor. And if you look back, um, it was it was created um you know there were a lot of ad hoc decisions made of of you know using the data that was available uh for also a completely different purpose for inclusion in in the web of science and the database and not for evaluating science but uh what happens is that we're still 60 years later after this indicator was um implemented or developed we're still re dealing with the adverse effects so uh we, i don't have to repeat this you all know that the, the problems with that. And on top of that, we also, most of these indicators are proprietary and irreproducible. So the impact factor, although we know the general formula, is still a black box. Um, so what we hopefully all agree on, if we do data citation metrics, is let's make a good metric. So it should be more than just a number. Uh, it shouldn't just be a count. Uh, it should always just be used to complement qualitative evaluation. So I completely agree with that. We also need peer review for data sets. Um, I also think that uh, any new metrics that we create should be open, transparent, transparent and reproducible. Uh, they shouldn't be owned by a company um, and they shouldn't be given such a power that we have a black box number that kind of determines academic careers. And most importantly, uh, next slide. Uh, next slide. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I think, uh, can you go back one? Sorry. <laughs> Uh, we need the metrics that we create to provide context. So uh, I mentioned this earlier already. We need, for example, disciplinary information to uh, normalize by discipline, by subject area, because we already know that data production um, uh, looks very different in different fields. So we can't just say, you know, like creating 10 data sets is great because it will look very different for somebody in, uh, let's say, cancer research compared to history. 
So I think we really need to normalize for these differences that are, we already know exist. Um, and we want those metrics to incentivize positive behavior. We want, all want to increase data uh, sharing and, and also uh, getting credit through data citation. Next slide, please. So why do I think we're not there? We can't create any metrics today. I think it's because we are lacking the necessary metadata and without that metadata, there aren't any metrics. So to give you an example here, um, if you look at everything that's in data site, if you, you can access this through the API, uh, you will notice that only 6% of their data sets have any discipline information. Um, and only one of the data sets are formally cited. And this is, we've seen this over and over again, um, that it's an issue that it's not a common norm yet to formally cite a data set in the reference list. So uh, we need to make this a norm. And without these metadata, without this information, which is on the one hand, the quality of the metadata, but on the other hand, the behavior of making citation the new norm, we can't create any uh, meaningful metrics. Next slide, please. So what do I, do I think we uh, do we have to do next? Next slide. I think we need to, first of all, all engage all stakeholders to make data citation the norm. And obviously that's not going to happen overnight. I think I mentioned this earlier that the regular citations have also just been around for uh, around a hundred years or so. Um, but we need to get there to make data formally cited in reference lists so that we can track it. Uh, we need to improve the metadata. So repositories should collect more and better metadata, especially for the discipline. And I also think, and this is kind of where I guess my team comes in, we need to conduct mixed method research and create more evidence on data sharing and data citation behavior across disciplines so that we can create um, benchmarks to create metrics. Next slide. And this is exactly what we're trying to do in the Meaningful Data Counts Research Project, which is a two-year project funded by Sloan, and it's, it's part of the larger Make Data Count initiative. Next slide. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Great. Thanks very much, Stephanie. Um, really good to get um, that perspective and sort of surfacing the, the way forwards there. Um, we now will hear from Anna Hatch, who's the program director at DORA, and Anna will start bringing together policy and research assessment before we move to our last speaker. And so over to you, Anna. Thank you for the kind introduction, Matt. Um, I'm excited to be part of such a thoughtful panel and share some of DORA's work that's focusing on supporting systems change at academic institutions. For those of you who are not familiar, DORA is an international nonprofit initiative to improve the ways that researchers are assessed in academia. We are supported by 16 organizations that include funders, publishers, scholarly societies, and academic libraries. And you can see the full list of our supporting organizations on our website. So we've heard a lot about recognizing and rewarding data today. And I wanna take a step back to discuss what institutional conditions and infrastructure are needed to support this kind of culture change and to share a new tool from DORA that can facilitate these change efforts at academic institutions. So if you wouldn't mind moving to the next slide, please. Um, research assessment reform is difficult to solve. And this is because it's a systems challenge that involves multiple stakeholders and what makes this even more challenging is the fact that individual interventions are not going to be effective. Point solutions cannot solve systems challenges. Instead, solving this type of challenge requires a collaborative approach that addresses the underlying culture, infrastructure, and conditions at an organization or a larger system. Um, so if you move to the next slide, this piece of knowledge motivated Dora to create a new tool called Space to Evaluate Academic Assessment, which was designed to support the development of new policies and practices. And you can access the rubric via the link on my slide, but I'll also try to drop it in the chat later. So Space was a community project. Nearly 75 individuals from 26 countries and six continents informed its development. And what it does is break down research assessment reform into six categories, standards, process, accountability, culture, 
and evaluative and iterative feedback. And it offers ideas of what conditions and infrastructures can support the development of these new policies and practices at different stages of readiness. So from just getting started to really expanding and scaling up through an institution. There are two ways that space can be used. So perspectively, it can help create a state of play for an institution. And so by identifying institutional strengths and weaknesses, you can um, create sort of next steps um, for both during your institutional infrastructure. But it can also be used in the retrospective sense to help analyze the outcomes of specific individual interventions um, to better understand why they may or may not have been as successful um, as you had hoped. So if you go to the next slide, very briefly, what I'd like to do is use one of Dora's case studies to offer some concrete ideas about what institutional infrastructure and conditions um, that are outlined in the space rubric actually look like in practice. So the Open University of Catalonia created a task force to develop a multi-year action plan to improve academic assessment. And by creating this formal plan that needed to be approved by the university, UOC was able to identify shared goals and general standards for research assessment. And next slide, please. Sort of moving from thinking about standards and shared values and goals to process mechanics. Um, an example sort of to highlight this is that UOC removed journal-based metrics from its postdoc applications and instead asked applicants to provide a narrative discussion of achievements that can include a range of academic outputs and impacts including um, data usage and reuse. Um, so moving on to the next slide. And this one's kind of sitting right in between process, me process mechanics and accountability um, is that we know policies are only affected, affected if they're adopted by the community. So the DORA task force at UOC was not only um, critical in outreach and advocacy, but they were absolutely crucial in providing training in these new evaluation procedures. Um, and so, um, sorry, if you'd move to the next slide. Um, in the context of today's discussion, I think it's also sort of worth briefly noting that Dora is developing a dashboard as part of our Project Terra initiative which is aiming to track criteria and standards academic institutions use for decisions that impact research careers, um, such as open science and data reuse. Um, didn't really have a chance to discuss it today, but feel free to check out more information on our website about that. Um, and I just wanna thank everyone for your time and I look um, forward to the panel discussion. Thanks very much, Anna, and it's great to sort of look at some of these tools and some of the approaches around research assessment and looking at a culture change that there's sometimes the, you know, if we look at a pyramid of making it required and making it normative at the top and making it possible and easy at the bottom and, and bringing these together is how we shift this culture change. Um, Moving on to our next panelist and final panelist, uh, Daniela Loenberg, um, who is representing Make Data Counts. Um, Daniela obviously has been working on data citation and the collective efforts for um, many years, um, probably um, the person with the most experience in this regard. And um, Daniela is gonna speak a bit about connecting these pieces together, and then we'll move into a brief uh, panel discussion and some closing remarks. And so over to you, Daniela. Thanks, Matt. So um, hopefully most folks have heard of Make Data Count before, but if you haven't, we're a scholarly change initiative focused on the development of open data metrics and we house standards, infrastructure and research. Um, and so thinking about this and kind of batting cleanup here, wrapping this together, I wanna break apart the question, are we ready for data citation metrics? Breaking that apart, are we ready for data citation? Absolutely. We've been ready for it for years. We're not as far along as we should be, and we're really playing catch up right now. Are we, are we ready for data metrics? Absolutely. We need them to drive the community forward. But are we ready to decide what data metrics are appropriate and right 
we're not there yet, as Stephanie pointed out, but we can get there. So next slide. So if there's one takeaway I would like for everyone to be able to walk away with this and receive is that there are steps every single one of us on this call today can take to build towards open data metrics. And so focusing specifically on data citation as opposed to usage and others, there's three principles to go over. One, next slide. Making data citation a priority is necessary and it's not the status quo right now. We've heard this from presentations in the first panel and in the second, but referring to this as a priority doesn't just mean publishers prioritizing putting it in references lists. Yes, that needs to happen. But prioritizing also means funders needs to emphasize and reward these practices. And we need to think grander, like saying that these data policies are not complete without data citation being a part of them. We also have to make it clear to researchers that proper data citation of data is more important than writing a canned data availability statement. We have to get moving on this now. Next slide. The second is that we have to make it open and Stephanie touched on this a bit, but we have to ensure that data citations and data metrics are openly aggregated, available and auditable, both so bibliometricians can work with these raw counts and metadata, but also so we can build trust around metrics. We have existing open infrastructure for this right now. And so we should all be supporting and implementing these frameworks. And for more information, you can look at our website that specifically has information and breaks it down on what to do and how. And we're so pleased that the recent NIH data science report also points to the need of implementing these standards that have been created that we house that can really move everyone forward. Next slide. And lastly, we need to make it evidence-based. And this is really just to reiterate what Dr. Halstein pointed out, citations need to be contextualized. And we can all support this now by supplying better metadata around data that we're all supporting. So at publishers, repositories, within lab groups, um, but also this make it evidence-based, funders should be looking into further investments in research around these topic areas. Dr. Halstein and her team are one of very few that are spending time looking into this, and there should be a lot more so that we can make this move quicker. So we'll be ready for data metrics once we all support, show our support for data citation in the form of action, prioritizing in terms of implementation and resourcing and what we're focusing on. We really have to get past this phase of having these meetings like this, where we're talking about how important it is and what we want. We really can't get forward to talk about complex topics ahead on this until we have broad adoption and data citation is status quo. It's just happening in the background. And so this meeting is successful today if each one of us walks away and ensures that our respective institutions and organizations we're representing are committed to and prioritizing the resourcing of data citation best practices. So let's all get started. Great, thanks very much, Daniela. Um, and so I think that was a nice segue into this collective effort and where we go to. Um, this is actually my slide that I wanted to, having looked at the panelists' slides uh, before the session, and so it does have the same branding, but as data site, we um, are involved in make data counts, and it's really important to us. So this is the slide that I wanted to just contextualize where we are in this process. And Daniela really nicely brought that together, I think, and it was really good to hear the different perspectives from the different stakeholders and this collective action that's needed. Um, we know that there's different perspectives and different um, activities that can be undertaken. So researchers to look at citing data in reference lists, citing data as outputs in your grants, CVs, anywhere you would make mention of, of um, your article, data repositories, collecting quality metadata, particularly on that subject area. We heard that from um, Stephanie. Uh, depositing the linkages from data sets to articles and preprints in DOI metadata. Publishers, making sure that you're collecting a citation and including this in the DOI metadata and allowing data citations in the reference list. Um, funders um, and policymakers advocate and require data citation practices. Um, we've heard about the data availability statement and moving away from that and acknowledging and rewarding data citation as reuse. Um, infrastructure, uh, keep all the data citation infrastructure open. We need to do this in an open, transparent way, let the community build together so metrics can be developed um, in a transparent, auditable way. And as a general takeaway from 
what we've heard is that we need to prioritize open data citations so that bibliometrics experts can begin to unveil what these indicators may be best fit for diverse data. And this will also allow us to openly develop data citation metrics as a community. It was really nice to hear Daniela break that question up. It was an interesting way of phrasing it. And, and I, for me, it, it really resonated in providing context to the way forwards. So with that, I think it will be nice. Um, I just wanna, apologies if I look at a different screen. Um, I wanted to jump into a few questions and there is a question um, from Megan that um, is for each of the panelists. And so the question is, if you could make one change today to move things forwards, what would you change? And so maybe I can just circle through through the panelists uh, briefly. If you can keep your responses fairly brief, um, if I can uh, start with you, Howard. Sure. So for me, um, being a chorus and being a collector of a lot of this metadata is, is really having people focus on metadata around data sets and software. Because as we've heard some of the speakers say today, there's not enough emphasis about that metadata. And so the things like subject classifications and others are, are all missing. Um, and I think it's a key step in order to start moving this forward. Thanks, Howard. Um, and Lucia? I just wanna you know, piggyback on what Howard said. And then I think that one of the things that we have painfully discovered is that metadata is really important for your future self. Of course, it's only important for me because I know what my research was. But if I want people to use my data properly, it's extremely difficult. And you know, we, 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 we face that challenge by just literally recognizing how difficult it was to integrate across two different data sets that are collected across two different laboratories. So for people to get that and to understand how these data were collected, we need much better metadata. Um, so then we can also integrate future data that we want to aggregate. So, and it's not, a it's not an easy task. We have tried that and it's very difficult. So I would love people to take this as the next challenge. Okay, thanks, Lucia. Uh, Stephanie? Yeah, I, I want to uh, add to that from like the perspective of what Howard also just said that uh, things like discipline information that is not even available. And that's true. And I think we often think, because we're so much used to the infrastructure from, from journal articles and you know having databases with a long history, like the Web of Science, for example, where we have some of this information, uh, but it's all proprietary. And we also don't have it for data sets. So um, it seems like such a trivial problem right now that you know we're trying to work towards uh, data citation metrics, but something as simple as that we can't really tell what discipline um, a data set is from, um, that's something we need to solve. And I think it's a community effort. And I think it's a community effort, like creating, um, you know, an open um, discipline classification for all of scholarly communication. Like if we think about the larger sense in terms of like, I just mentioned in the chat, uh, the initiative for open citation. So the bibliometric community is trying to uh, rebuild something like the Web of Science or Scopus but open and free and accessible because we think that uh, bibliographic information and citations, th this belongs to the community. It shouldn't be owned by publishers or for profit companies. Um, I think we have to do the same for, for data citations. And I think the, the advantage there is that we are kind of starting from scratch. So I think we, we have to avoid falling to the same traps. Um, so making the whole infrastructure open from, from the beginning so that everybody can re reuse it. Um, and, and make the whole evaluation process and, and the, the counting also accessible to everyone and not again owned by for-profit companies. Thanks, Stephanie. Anna? Um, so I think when sort of, when considering what type of data citation metrics to use in development, a clear first step is sort of aligning on what are the objectives of these measures, um, what are sort of the goals and the values that will be brought into creating them. Thanks, Anna. And Daniela? Um, I think just changing the notion that we need to figure everything out before we can get started on anything. I think a lot of conversations that are happening around this right now is, but what about this case and this case and this case? And then yet we're not doing 
So let's take it step by step and just do and do and do and build from there instead of waiting because we've been waiting for years and it hasn't worked. Thanks, Daniela. I see uh, Stephanie's got your hand. You've got your hand up. So I guess you wanted to maybe have a brief comment. Yeah, just uh, uh, related to this too. I think it was brought up earlier that, for example, DUIs, we want that to be the standard for data sets because then we can track it and uh, their permanent identifiers and so on. Um, and I think the comment was brought up in, in the first part today that Yes, there aren't common in all fields, right? Uh, but maybe on a on a more positive note, I've seen this um, in the last five to ten years. Uh, we had something similar in in alt metrics. So the idea there was to you know track traces and mentions of journal articles across different fields. And I remember very early studies where we had to say. Uh, a lot of in a lot of fields, the DUI are the DUIs aren't the standard, but because um, you know, mentions and metrics have been traced to the DUI, they became more common. So it's this whole like we can't stop everything because we don't have all the information yet. The fact that we're going to move in this direction also means that uh, others will follow. So I completely agree with Daniela and others saying that, you know, we need to to start from from all all sides and, and move there. And we can't expect that things change overnight uh, and, and wait until then. The the one thing that I want to make uh, like emphasize in this regard is that we have to be really careful when we do create metrics. So like, you know, if we would be doing this now based on the information we have at the moment, it's really, really hard uh, to remove a metric once it's out there in the wild. And I would be very careful uh, to do that too quickly. Thanks, Stephanie, for the additional comments. And, you, you know, I think this was something that I had noted um, listening to some of the discussions and thinking about this is that if the community is not mindful of our responsibility in, in building assessment up front, there are risks in advancing open data sharing practices. And so we need to be really, really mindful of this. Think about what the policy's goals are. Um, we don't want to lose the community ownership. I see in the chat, uh, uh, you know, comments around that. That's really, really important. Um, we, we don't um, want to make sure that we doing things in a disparate manner and that we um, rather want to focus on this collective action and, and bringing it together and but also importantly not waiting for each other and so that's why I also um, pasted in the chat some of the the things of what we can do now across the different stakeholder groups and and you know moving forwards because that collective action is is really what helps us um, work through this um, so I also wanted to um, put something back to um, the audience and general attendees, you know, it, it, we've spoken a lot and the panelists have spoken a lot about it being this collective effort um, in moving it forwards. And so I would love to see either in the chat or on social media today, um, if you could um, share what you are doing to make data citation metrics possible and make data counts, you know, bringing this um, to light and, and making this um, we're surfacing this more. And so I'll put that in the chat as well. Um, while I'm doing that, I don't know if there's any final comments from any of the panelists. Um, we are um, about on time. We've got uh, one or two minutes before we have the final closing. Um, you, can eat, you can also eat into the final closing if you'd like, Matt, that's fine. <laughs> okay. I see, uh, Lucia, you had a hand up. I have more a question than, you know, or, or a concern if you want. <clears throat> so one thing is about how we, you know, create, you know, the, the indices of this. One of the things that I have been thinking recently is that because, so if we see this large scale consortium being something more prominent in the future, what also this entails is that people's contribution to the science is different. So how could any of these metrics evaluate the contribution that people make and 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 in certain sense you know like you can think about you know more of as a graph like i belong to a certain community I, I i i create very good software or i am the i am the kind of person that produce very good data or i'm the kind of person that produce very good theories so are there metrics that can capture also that diversity and not just a number so I think this is probably best for Stephanie to, to address. I don't know, there's probably other panelists that want to add comments, but maybe Stephanie, if you want to make a comment. 
Um, yeah, I think it's a really good point. And I also think that we always need to see things in context. So we've been talking about metrics and we mostly talk about quantitative uh, indicators there. Um, but always uh, this needs to be complementary um, to qualitative peer review, right? So they can never replace it. But I think if we're moving towards, you know, just trying to push data uh, as like, um, on the same level or similar level as, uh, you know, a valuable output as journal articles are, I think the, the metrics can have help as a first step um, to show, look, what we're doing there, there are other people are reusing us, this kind of idea of pellets of peer recognition, as, as Merton has said it for article citations, is like, it's some evidence of that it's used by others. That doesn't mean it's great <laughs> necessarily, but it's a first step to what's showing this. Um, but it does not replace any kind of qualitative assessment, of course. Thanks. Anna? Yeah, I just like to emphasize that the need to sort of balance the quantitative and the qualitative assessment. Um, one of the things that I sort of pointed out in the case study that I shared was UOC had switched to sort of a narrative um, for to just for postdoc applicants to describe their achievements, um, and that provided a way to just to sort of broaden the bar from just journal publications to now also con contributions to open science or being able to describe the societal impacts of their research. Um, so I think the qualitative really helps capture what numbers can't and provide that context. Absolutely agree. And um, so I will, we, we're about up on time. And so I'll, I'll um, close out um, this session. I think um, Howard um, will say a few words from the chorus point of view. Um, I do also want to um, make mention of the Make Data Count initiative, which has done extensive work around um, data citation metrics. And I'll drop the link to the website in the chat and feel free to reach out to the group. There's many of us on this panel, but some in the community that are involved in the effort and um, step by step making making progress so um, I wanted to end with that and um, thank you all for joining the session I'll hand back to you Howard um, for I think um, your final closing remarks. Great so that was a wonderful session thank you so much Matt and to all the speakers um, so I want to once again thank our sponsors who helped make this happen ACS AIPP uh, ACM, SPIE, and AMS. Um, today's been a really useful thing. Um, Tara, can you po post the last thing in chat for us? Um, so we do have an exit poll. So if you can at some point uh, fill that out. Um, and also just want to mention that this is just one of many events that Chorus likes to host. Um, and we like to work with partners. So today we work with AGU, uh, but equally we worked with um, our two moderators who helped us very much in, in establishing the speakers and also est establishing the agenda. So if you have ideas that you think are, are related to some of the course goals that are published on our website and as also that I was talking about today, uh, by all means, bring them forward. Um, let's, let's have that discussion. We, we need to have more discussions, but equally, as you heard from all of the, the panelists today, we need to do more experimentation and we need to do things to move the ball forward. Um, this, you know, we've been talking about this for a very long time. Um, and I think now's the time for us to really start to do things. And Chorus is willing to step up and either host some of those uh, things that we can do together or take part in them. So um, by all means, reach out to us and, and contact us. So thank you very much. With that, we will close. So everybody, thanks so much for your participation. And thanks so much to all the panelists and moderators for doing an excellent job today. We really appreciate it. Thank you.